Um, so thank you very much um, for your time and let me introduce the next panel discussion that we have today. So our next uh, panel discussion will be based on uh, the Common Agricultural Policy and European Policy Developments. Um, so I'd like to welcome to this panel discussion Green MEP Francisco Guerrero, who is very active on all things agriculture and food in his role as Vice Chair of the, uh, Agri, uh, the European Parliament's Agri Committee. We have Luigi Tozzi. I may not have pronounced that correctly, sorry Luigi, um, who is the Senior Manager in Quality Production and Food and Feed Safety at Confagricultura, that's the Italian Farmers uh, Organization, and also Vice Chairman of the Copacajaca Working Group on Organic Production. We also have with us Tim Thorpe, Senior Campaigns and Policy Officer at the Vegan Society, and Henry Delon, De De Delegue, pardon, sorry, uh, Deputy Head of the Gaddix at um, DG Agri. So let's open with some introductory remarks. Um, Dr. Harwitz's presentation makes the case for the need uh, of a shift in our food practices and how do you think policymakers at the EU level should respond to this call to action? And perhaps you can add some reflections from the conference so far. Sorry, I'll come to you first, Francisco. Thank you. Yeah, hello. Uh, good morning to everyone. Sorry, I didn't answer the question was for me. Uh, well, uh, first of all, thank you for, for the invitation. I'm very glad to be here. Uh, well, we should uh, first use science as our model to make our political decision. And in several ways that is not being uh, done here in the European Parliament, and we also see this at several other levels, uh, also at national level, regional level, and especially when we talk about agriculture um, models and agricultural practices. And so I think that the common agriculture policy that is a very important slice of the EU budget and obviously has direct repercussions on the environment, biodiversity, and also on, on human health and animal welfare, uh, has to has to, to to take this into account. So the science knowledge that we now have, the data that we that the scientists uh, tell us for decades. So this is not new. Uh, one of the things that we are we are talking about for decades is that we really needed to change our way of producing, distribution, and consuming food. And now, obviously, this this is a reality. But this is common for decades. And so we should apply this to the new common agriculture policy. But as we see in negotiations there's still a very conservative approach, especially from the Council, and uh, also on other, other strategies, uh, namely the farm to fork that is also being postponed. And so we can see that there's a lot of lobbying being done, uh, trying to, to make this, this shift that is urgent and, and strictly necessary uh, to, to be as smooth for the common business, the agri multi-business as usual. So if we don't really change the, 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 the way we, we we use public money in helping farmers and helping the communities uh, tackling these, these issues. We won't uh, manage to, to reduce our, our climate footprint. And this has also uh, several other, other issues regarding water scarcity in, Port in Portugal is a huge, huge problem, water scarcity, biodiversity de degradation, soil degradation, and so on and so forth. Thank you very much, Francisco, for your opening remarks. I'll now turn to um, Luigi for your opening remarks. Many thanks. Many thanks to see if uh, to have body. Um, just uh, to say to you that I will talk just for my uh, organization, Italian organization of Agricultura, even if I'm also the vice president uh, of the working party in organic in, uh, of Copa, but I don't talk uh, for the for the Copa, even if our uh, position are in line, of course. Uh, first of all, I, I get to say that. Um, uh, farmers are producers, are enterprises. So we produce what you need. If you need more protein, vegetable proteins, we produce uh, more vegetable proteins. You, if you need animal proteins, we produce animal proteins. This is not a, a, a problem really for us. Uh, what we have to do anyway, we have to uh, uh, change maybe the, the, the mind of the, the person. Um, First of all, we have to talk about the diet, the equilibrated day, uh, diets. Um, in the equilibrated day, diets, uh, you need uh, all, all kinds of foods and proteins, uh, but uh, it's important that you uh, know how 
uh, when you have you need some uh, protein some sugar some nutrients and when you don't need it and this is the first thing that uh, i think we um we have to do we have to uh, uh, uh to teach to people how to uh, eat really <laughs> uh, eat very uh, uh, good this is will change of course all the problem in the metabolic uh, 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 six for examples and uh, and and also uh, there will be a, a, a useful uh, uh, way to to use the the food uh, it's important that uh, maybe when you are pregnancy you eat some kind of proteins <laughs> some kind of sugars but not when you are old like me for example <laughs> you don't need so much sugars now uh, of course because uh, you're you old okay <laughs> you don't need it so this is important uh, i think and this is the fifth thing the first thing that the uh, the commission the the, the, the EU has to uh, to do when we change this kind of uh, a, a, a way and everybody knows how to, how to eat uh, well and good for for his health this should be the 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 the, the first point to change the needs and so we will produce for this needs there's another thing that i would like to say um uh, I take it the um, I've, I, I've seen the, the presentation for, from uh, the Harvard scientist, uh, and she talks about the uh, how, how many calories gives the beef, for example. Uh, it's it's uh, it's right. We we have anyway uh, other kinds of proteins, animal proteins that, that we can use, for example, that have uh, less impact. Uh, for example, eat insects uh, should be uh, an, a, another way to. Uh, to 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 get proteins and more proteins. Uh, for example, there is a, a FAO uh, study that say that for two kilograms of feed uh, with insects, uh, you have one kilogram of food. And instead, the with eight kilograms of feed, uh, one kilogram of food uh, for for cattle. Uh, the insects for uh, you don't uh, use uh, anyway um, uh, grassland uh, or, or something else uh, and uh, you, you can be more sustainable but i don't think that everybody wants to eat just uh, insect or this kind of products you know uh and another thing that we have to say in a way that uh, um, animal production uh, is not uh, uh, um, linked also to the food but also to the environment yes it's true but for example in our mountains i think about alpi for example or in other grassland the animals are very important to maintain the grassland you don't you cannot do in, in another way and this is important of course for for the soil and it's important for uh, for the uh, for, for the environment so there is another function also for the, the animals uh, the, the animals production okay thank you thank you very much we've had insects people as as livestock we've had all kinds of innovative uh, solutions put forward today um let me now turn to Henri uh, for your uh, for your introductory remarks the floor is yours Oh, Henri, you are on mute. You have to unmute yourself. All right. You there we me? go. Yes. yes. Thank you. Well, uh, Natasha, you, you asked, um, how do you think policymakers at EU level should respond to this call for action? Well, I think uh, to a certain extent, of course, they have already done so. We have the broader picture of the European Green Deal of December 19. We have this, uh, the farm to fork and biodiversity strategies of May 2020. And of course, in the farm to fork strategy, it's explicitly mentioned that we need to promote uh, sustainable food consumption and we need to facilitate the shift to healthy, sustainable diets. And then within that context, as one of the actions mentioned, uh, it says that we have to boost organic farming 
And then related to that, of course, we have the target of achieving 25% of agricultural land under organic farming by uh, 2030. Now, why organics? Of course, this is very important for the Commission because, first of all, the direct benefits of organic farming uh, in terms of climate, in terms of environment, in terms of biodiversity, in terms of animal welfare, but of course also because organic farming has a multiplier effect. Any increase in organic farming will also help us to achieve the other targets of the farm to fork strategy, of course, the reductions in fertilizer use, pesticide use, antimicrobials. Now, this objective is, is very ambitious, uh, we are now in the EU, I mean, these data from 2019, we're at 8.5%, of course, of agricultural land under organic farming. We want to achieve 25%. If we would extrapolate current trends, we would achieve only between 15 and 18%. So this action plan, which we have then adopted in support, is really about achieving these extra 10%. And maybe uh, later on in the panel, I can tell you a little bit more about the approach taken by the action plan, the concrete content. But this is it for the moment. Thank you. Thank you very much. And then last but absolutely not least, let's go to Tim for your uh, for your reflect opening reflections about how policymakers can respond to this call for action. Fantastic. Thank you, Natasha. And uh, it's great to be here and speak to you all today. Um, I think. We, we've heard a lot about um, the multidimensional um, sides to, to food and the sustainability of food. Um, I was really interested in the, talking about um, kind of not reducing, not reducing our, our response to, to some silver bullet solutions. Um, but we also need to be absolutely clear about what sustainable diets look like for, um, for food users. Um, and I don't think we should shy away from recognizing the fact in at the policy level um, that animal products, as we heard from from Helen and um, and from from the intergovernmental panel on climate change and um, other speakers and, and reports, that animal products are much less efficient overall and in general than uh, plant-based diets. Um, and and I think it's interesting that we've been able to the farm to fork strategy is able to recognize and we been able to recognize in policy um, the role for organic and a target for increasing organic, um, but not to recognize that and not to have that um, as a target for EU level policy. Um, so, so why is that, I think, is a question that it would be worth exploring today. Um, more broadly, I think the EU needs to be much bolder in setting a vision for, for a coherent food policy um, and, and this has to in, this has to include not just agriculture policy, but also trade policy to make sure that's consistent with domestic agriculture policy in, in the EU um, and aligning that with changing behavior in, in, in food environments um, and where go to where people actually actually buy their food as well. So it has to be joined up thinking across all of those different areas of policy. And I think that's something that um, at the EU level, we policy has struggled with so far. Um, so for instance, we could do with better targeting of farm subsidies. Um, and also we could do with better targeting of funding for education and information. So an obvious, obvious example here is that the EU's agriculture product advertising budget um, has spent over 250 million euros over the last five years um, on promoting animal products. Um, and on promoting those to EU consumers. And most recently, we had the beefetarian campaign, um, convincing people to, to eat more beef and to, to not feel guilty about consuming uh, large amounts of animal products. Um, and that directly contradicts um, the direction of travel that we need to see uh, in the EU. So we've got kind of spending on the one hand and objectives and strategic goals in the EU Green Deal and the farm to fork strategy, um, but we also have agriculture spending, which is which is directly conflicting with that. So I think trying to resolve some of those um, incoherent uh, elements is 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 important for the next step. Um, but yeah, I'll leave my opening comments there and uh, look forward to the discussion. 
Thank you very much, Tim. And I, we'll, I'll definitely ask a question about uh, this promotion policy that you mentioned. Um, we'll, we'll definitely dig into that a little bit more. But firstly, um, Francisco, let me turn to you first. I mean, cap reform, we've been living and breathing this all week. I feel like it's all I've been doing for the last uh, two weeks. Um, you're a member, you're heavily involved in the talks. I mean, we've spoken about the role that this reform has in shaping the future of our of our food systems. And Helen has impressed really the urgency of action. Do you see that there's still any potential in this cap reform to be able to support this kind of farming? I mean, what is your what is your position here? Are you uh, still optimistic that there might be a some hope that the cap reform can contribute to sustainable farming. As a whole, no. Uh, to be clear, uh, the negotiations I don't see them coming in the in the right way. Um, we continue to subsidize the industrial animal farming. Uh, we don't have the necessary uh, shifts and mechanisms uh, to finance uh, production of expensive goods as as we should. Uh, the public procurement scheme also. Um, it's not clear if it will be uh, used to, to finance local uh, biological and uh, vegetable uh, producers, uh, food uh, producers. So the scheme is, is quite unclear. So I think it, it should be also a very important thing to be, to be added here on CAP. Uh, and overall, we see that there's a lot of uh, greenwashing surrounding the, the possibility of, of turning uh, large amounts of money to marketing, also as Tim uh, Thorpe said, uh, animal products, uh, making the greenwashing, they are sustainable, uh, and that's obviously, a, a, well, a greenwash. <laughs> uh, we also have the school scheme uh, on milk uh, products that continues to, 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 to tell uh, directly and indirectly our children that milk products are good for you, are good for your health, are good for the environment, so they normalize a product that now, nowadays we understand that doesn't have these positive effects. And so there's several other things, uh, also the incentives that, that should be uh, applied to farmers so they can make the transition to uh, sustainable products. And so this cap doesn't really uh, go into those details. And I would also say that the, um, the, the EMFF, so the, the, the fisheries fund, also it was negotiated in trilogue. So we are talking about food. And so this is normally uh, it's out of scope, but it's directly connected to the way we, we eat and we produce food. And the EMFF, so the, the funds for fishery, is also very detrimental for environments. And so it finances also big industry, gives a lot of resources to uh, big scale uh, fishing fleets. And so again, we have uh, very nice words, but in the end, when we go to the practicalities, the major political uh, forces don't have the courage to well, make the shift that it's needed. Mm -hmm. So saying all the right words, but not seeing the action in in your in your opinion, Luigi. Maybe I'll come to you on this. I mean, you know, what what is your opinion from maybe bringing the farmers' perspective here? Um, what is your opinion on these kind of financial mechanisms that exist within the cap and changing kind of the subsidy um, programs for more sustainable production? Um, do you see any kind of positive positive movement in terms of the cap reform in this respect? Yes, May, thanks for this question. We had in the, the last um, two caps uh, a positive way um, because, for example, we have decreased about 30% the use of fertilizer and pesticides in general. So um, the, the, the last 15 years uh, uh, has given, in a way, a very good uh, uh, positive impact. And this is good also for farmers because uh, Pesticides and fertilizer are a cost anyway for us, and also for our health. Uh, you you have the receive of pesticides. We can breathe <laughs> the pesticides directly. So, <laughs> not to use or use less is better for us, of course. Um, first of all, it's a cost, so uh, it's very good. That's why we uh, protect not only organic but also other precision farming, for example, or other kinds of uh, agriculture that are going uh, to the sustainable, uh, uh, to a sustainable uh, view. Uh, what, uh, uh, what I can say, uh, I, 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 I can give just the, uh, um, the perspective that uh, the organic farming, the Italian organic farming have. Um, we have seen that uh, uh, 
during this, the, uh, the, those 50 years, uh, we have taken a lot of money okay, to uh, promote the uh, organic farming. But we have also seen that in the last four years, the, uh, uh, the land with, it, with this in conversion decreased. So there is a question, why, if you have given us money, we don't want to make more organic production? The problem is that in the gap between uh, the, uh, the prices that we had four years ago, uh, for example, for wet or for the, 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 the organic product, uh, uh, raw materials in general, are very interesting for us. <laughs> there was a, a very big gap. In those years, the gap between the conventional and the organic has decreased, and the decrease then is going to increase. And why? Because the, you, have, you don't have just to think about the agriculture in the food system, of course. You have also to, uh, to, to, to understand who is buying and what is buying. In the last two years, three years, uh, for example, Le, uh, Leclerc, it's a very important uh, uh, pre-distribution organization as uh, uh, the uh, uh, prices of organic products at the same prices of the conventional one. Oh, if you do in this way, the value of the organic production is not is, is the same as of the conventional. So if they have taken and they have given this message to the person, they don't give more value to the to the to the organics. Okay, this is a problem, and if they want to do it, uh, they have to reduce the, the cost of the price of the, the raw materials. So, at the end of this uh, of, of my thinking, the problem is first of all you have to see what the market is asking and what the grid. Uh, uh, retailers and the grid transformers are doing and where they take the raw materials. If you give me, in, uh, uh, you, you say, I want just to, uh, uh, to promote uh, uh, European production, organic production, is not enough because they can write in the label if they want or not, but if they want, they can write made in Europe, okay, but not with the European uh, raw materials. And this is a problem because they take the materials, the raw materials, the organic, okay, called organic <laughs> raw materials from the extra Europe, from uh, Turkey, from uh, Brazil, from China, from everyone, from Azerbaijan, okay, and so they can have less cost, of course. And this is a, a, a it's not a, a direct uh, uh, um, a finance to the, uh, uh, to the um, uh, European farmers, but to the Turkish one. So uh, what, what is very important, we want to, to have more, uh, uh, more uh, organic production in Europe. Yes, okay. We have to give the right remuneration to the farmers, first of all. And if you want to say where the prices is made, go to the retailers, go to the, uh, to the uh, transformers. Mm. Thank you. I mean, I think this is a, probably an interesting moment to bring um, Henri in to respond to this. I mean, um, here Luigi is is highlighting um, something we've spoken about. Stakeholders speak about a lot, matching kind of market de demand, um, what the market's asking, what consumer wants with production, and the organic plan. I know you 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 highlighted this in your introduction. Um, you know, aims to kind of address this. Can you expand on this? And maybe also let's touch upon something that Tim um, raised about the promotion policy. I mean, what role does that play in promoting? organic uh, consumption of organic products yes <clears throat> so um, let me maybe say um, mention a few horizontal features of the action plan first and then let me discuss a bit more the financial mechanisms because I hear a lot of things I'm not sure all of them are uh, equally correct or up to date um, the first one is, is really about this action plan. What you have to understand is, of course, that uh, this action plan doesn't come alone. It comes in, in a broader context. And this broader context is, uh, first of all, 
that we have the new organic uh, regulation, the new organic legislation, which will enter into application uh, 1st of January next year. And that will be really important to provide uh, the farmers with this long-term um, predictability, stability of the legal framework. So that's a very important framework condition. Then, and I will get back to that, uh, this action plan comes at the moment when we can mobilize different sources of financing. We have the CAP, and I will explain a bit later on. We have, for instance, the Research Innovation Framework Program, Horizon Europe. Uh, indeed, uh, there is the promotion policy, there is a school scheme. So there is a, a bundle of financial instruments that are available. There is also, for instance, green public procurement at national level. So again, a very important framework condition. And then we have, of course, a very high level of consumer trust in organics we can build on. We see an increasing uh, recognition of the organic logo we can build on. Uh, also, we have seen when for the organic action plan, we carried out a public stakeholder consultation. We've seen a lot of support for the analysis of the problems and the obstacles for the sector, but also for uh, the actions proposed. Now, let me discuss a bit now horizontally this, this action plan. So this action plan clearly takes a demand-led approach, a demand-driven approach, because the basic a rationale, the basic assumption is, of course, that there will be no conversion unless farmers see, unless producers also see increasing demand for their product. Now, having said that, this action plan takes a very comprehensive approach because it doesn't stop at uh, increasing demand. There is a second axis, of course, on increasing supply. And there is also an axis dedicated to sustainability. So it is demand-led, but we cover demand, supply, sustainability. Also, this is an action plan that uh, doesn't just uh, concern the public sector. It's also addressed the private sector. Uh, it also involves the whole value chain from the farmers down to the restaurants. So I've heard in the previous sessions the words holistic, complex, uh, this is a bit the approach which uh, the action plan also tries to take. And then to say that uh, in particular for the third axis, there is a lot of um, attention being paid to research innovation. So within the budget in Horizon Europe, which is focused on uh, agriculture, forestry, rural areas, we would reserve 30% for our uh, subjects relevant for our uh, organics directly or indirectly. So a very sizable part of the research budget for agriculture, forestry reserved for uh, organics. Now about financial mechanisms, if you allow me, and just picking up on some of the questions uh, which were raised before or comments which were made. So as the action plan, maybe first on the promotion policy, as the action plan mentions very explicitly, uh, we intend to dedicate a very substantial part of the uh, promotion of the agriculture promotion budget to the promotion of organic products. And we have already started this year. So 27% of the budget, 49 million, is dedicated uh, solely to the promotion of organic products. And also for the following years, the objective is clearly to maintain an ambitious budget. So it's clear that agricultural promotion policy and the promotion of organic products within the EU, but also in promising third country growth markets, because of course, if our farmers can export to third country growth markets, that will also have a positive impact on the expansion of the land under organic farming. So this agricultural promotion in the EU, outside the EU is absolutely crucial for the action plan. On the school scheme, and then I will get into the, the cap more narrowly, but on the school scheme, and that's also mentioned explicitly in the action plan. So indeed this promotes the, uh, or this uh, facilitates access in the schools to milk and milk products and fruits and vegetables. There is a major review coming up, which will be achieved by 2023. And also there we are exploring uh, how can we increase the share of organic products in the school scheme? So again, this is an issue that will be very important for the success of the action plan. 
it's mentioned explicitly there. Now on the cap, our perception is, uh, and that is also mentioned again in the action plan, uh, we want to mobilize the cap to the fullest extent possible for the success of this action plan. And there are different dimensions to that. There is, of course, the financial side, and I will explain that there's pillar one with the eco schemes and there's pillar two with the environmental management commitments. But of course, very important, the CAP also covers advisory services, technical assistance. So CAP support will be crucial financially, but also in terms of advice and training and so on. Now, what the commission has done is the commission in December uh, last year has issued recommendations to the member states on the preparation of national plans for the CAP, the CAP mm -hmm. national strategic plans. And the commission has asked the member states, um, first of all, to define a target for each of the Green Deal targets. So this includes the land under organic farming and then also to explain uh, which interventions they would plan in support of those targets. So member states will have to fix a national target. They will have to explain how they will use the cap to achieve that target. And of course, the modalities of submission and assessment and approval of these plans are still being negotiated, but it's clear that there will be an assessment phase by the commission and an approval phase. So, there is a very important tool to uh, achieve an ambitious national target and to have a coherent set of measures in support. Mm -hmm. Thank, you. Thank you very much. And now let me come to Tim. I mean, clearly there is this, this strong push on organic. We've heard this from Henri. But how do we start to shift mindsets and kind of foster the promotion and development of plant-based organic farming specifically. We've spoken about this promotion policy. You reserved quite a lot of criticism in your opening remarks. Maybe you could talk a little bit about this. Yeah, and you know, I I think I just wanted to kind of stress again and highlight what Helen uh, pointed to earlier on in, in, in her presentation about the fact that, that we are not going to meet our, our 1.5 degree climate target or even our two degree climate target um, unless we vastly, vastly reduce the amount of animal products produced and consumed within the UK. So this discussion around, you know, whether we can achieve a, an increase in the proportion of agricultural land that goes into organic um, is, is important, really important, but um, is not going to bring us those carbon reductions that we need to see to, eat, to meet the, the ambitions of, of, for example, the EU uh, Green New Deal. Um, so. I think that's what I was saying, I think was, was lacking in, in the current cap reform proposals um, in that the, there just isn't anything in relation to that. And it is the, and it is the single biggest issue in, in agriculture in the EU, certainly in relation to climate change. Um, and I would say in relation to land use as well. So yeah, I think that, that's something that I would just stress and, and, and underline again. Um, I think we need like a, a process of learning and understanding about the food system to continue that we've seen in the last few years as well. That there has been a lot of um, misunderstanding around uh, amongst food users, amongst consumers around what the um, what sustainable diets look like. Um, Well-meaning phrases like um, food miles and things like that have have given people the impression that if you buy local, whatever you buy, whether it's intensively produced, factory farmed. Um, chicken, or if it's uh, extensively grazed uh, beef and dairy, that, that, that as long as it's local, um, that that's somehow a climate positive thing or a good thing. Um, and that, that completely misunderstands um, what the issue of the food system is. So I think we have seen that education and, the, and food and, and the real impact of food come right up the environmental agenda, um, certainly with uh, NGOs and the environmental movement highlighting that more and more. Um, so we're going to need a continuation of that public understanding, I think, before we see um, significant changes in policy. Um, but yeah, I think th there are there are some just, uh, I think, basic um, steps that can be taken to, to help promote plant foods um, at the EU level. So one thing that could be done immediately is to look at 
mandatory coupled support in the cap proposal um, for human edible legumes and really incentivize human edible legumes. We need to get more um, varieties of human ed edible legumes that are appealing to uh, customers. We need to encourage food manufacturing that um, uses legumes and markets these to, to food users. Um, and we need to focus um, advertising and information and education on legumes in diets and the role they can play in diets. These are really, really sustainable crops. They can help continue to bring down our fertilizer use as well as improving public health across, across the EU. So there's some basic, I think, things that are, are the, the kind of first domino, if you like, the really important um, elements that will unlock uh, a more sustainable food system in the EU. Um, and, and, and that's one of them. Thank you very much. Um, perhaps, Francisco, I could, I could turn to you on this one. I mean, Tim has just put forward some uh, concrete suggestions, you know, this coupled support within the cap for um, legumes for human consumption. What, what was your response on this, on these concrete uh, suggestions? Well, I, I would subscribe them completely, so I'm, I'm very in favour of, of these suggestions. Uh, and, and I'm not in favor of us trying to 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 greenwash the, the the need that we really need to do as as citizens and and as as a block uh, trades talk about the the um, the trade policies that we have and so I think that's very important because if we don't do the efforts to to make the trade uh, as much greener as we can uh, the, all the efforts that we are doing here. Uh, with farmers, with citizens, and also with governments and the public money that we are spending on, on this shift will be lost. So uh, the international trade is also very, very important. And I think also education is, is very relevant. And nowadays we are seeing a huge shift towards a plant-based diet uh, because citizens recognize the health benefits, the animal welfare uh, issues, and obviously the, the, the impact on climate change. And let's not forget when we talk about animal farming, we are talking about sentient beings. So that's also very, very, this doesn't uh, come around very often. We now see that, for example, in Portugal, we had whale, whale hunting in the 80s, uh, and we quickly and shiftly uh, ended the, this practice because we understood that these are sentient beings, they are very important for the ecosystems, and this was a very, um, a very traditional um, activity in Portugal, especially in, in Azores Island, and we did end it. Nowadays we have tourism, and so also these these industries that are uh, based on, on animal production should be shifted and helped to uh, more plant-based uh, production, so we can really tackle all these issues. And for me, it's clear that we don't have uh, and science data shows that we don't have this this uh, amount of time, we don't have decades decades to to make this shift. And so we really have to be very prioritized when we are talking about uh, climate and health policies. Mm. I'm now going to move to um, some of the questions we've had from the audience. I have a question here that's directed at um, Luigi, an anonymous question. Um, but they would like to know, how can, how can consumers change their behaviour if they live in a system that promotes products which are not necessarily healthy or environmentally healthy? What's your take on that, Luigi? Healthy. What, what does it mean, healthy? Healthy is uh, uh, it's linked to your healthy. First of all, uh, as I say to you, I'm older than you, Natasha, and I can uh, uh, eat more, more sugar than, than you, okay? Uh, this, so sugar is, is healthy for you now, but it's not healthy for me now, okay? Even if last week, uh, no, last uh, Sunday I made uh, 40, 40, 42 kilometers, uh, kilometers by work, okay? Because I'm a, a worker. <laughs> uh, so uh, healthy is, uh, is 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 very is very um, linked to 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 you and environmental environmental depends on how do you uh, really uh, um, calculate the environmental impact. I mean, uh, we used to talk about the biogenic production of the CO two uh, and or methane and uh, or not biogenic one. Uh, agriculture produce CO2, biogenic CO2, uh, carbon dioxide. Uh, I use the carbon dioxide that is still now here in the air 
uh, with the solar uh, energy and I produce proteins, okay, in general proteins, sugars, uh, and, and so on. You know, this is the, 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 the circle of life, uh, say, the King Lions. Uh, I'm using the, CO, the, the carbon dioxide of today, not the carbon dioxide that is uh, imprisoned in the, uh, um, in the fuels, okay, in the fuels of the petroleum fuels. That was the CO2, the carbon dioxide, of a lot of uh, he, uh, million years ago. And when I destroy the, I, I use the energy that is in this uh, uh, carbon dioxide linked in, link in the link of the carbon dioxide to, to retake energy, I repute the uh, carbon dioxide of a, a million years ago. And this is the problem. <laughs> Because the, the, uh, the, 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 there is no equilibrium that you can uh, have uh, using or re using the, C, the, the carbon dioxide that you use that you have now, or the carbon dioxide that you have in, 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 in a million years ago. So uh, uh, agriculture in general, also the animal production. Uh, is a uh, uh, is a method that is in equilibrium, uh, quite in equilibrium, within uh, the, uh, the, the 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 environment. Instead, the using of uh, petroleum fuels, for example, is not in equilibrium. This is the problem we think. <laughs> okay, and okay. anyway, I don't think that there is a, another way in this in this world in this. In, in our earth, how to use the uh, energy of solar and making uh, uh, vital energy, then the agriculture, and then the, uh, the, the animal production. Uh, okay. There is no, no way. I'm gonna, have, sorry, I'm gonna have to inter interrupt there. We're okay. running out of time, but thank you. I will just take one last question. I'd like to direct this at Honoré. Um, there is a question from the audience, um, again, anonymous, um, but it is about this idea that Tim raised, you know, is it, in your opinion, um, you know, is it contradicting for the Commission to continue supporting meat consumption um, via promotional policies, um, whilst we have, you know, the farm to fork strategy talking about reduction of uh, meat consumption is that contradictory in your opinion yes thank you um <clears throat> also there i think we 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 have to be uh, very precise in, in what we are saying um there is uh, what what the farm to fork strategy actually says well let me first explain about the promotion policy because uh also there just as for the school scheme there is a major review uh, actually ongoing right now, and uh, which of course uh, happens against the background of the, the beating cancer action plan and so on and so on. So all these elements will be taken on board. But when you look at the current legal framework for the promotion policy, uh, it says it's very much focused on competitiveness of uh, European producers and so on. So for the moment, we are living with the current legal base. Now, even so, as I've said, there is uh, much attention being paid already from this year to the promotion of organic products and more broadly to fruits and vegetables and even more broadly to sustainably produce uh, products. Now, there is an, an entirely different dimension, which we should not forget, which is the one of the geographical indications which are mentioned explicitly in the legal base for the promotion policy, and which are, uh, we have to say, they're often based, uh, there are cheeses, there are meat products and so on. So we cannot just one day to the next forget about all of that. So there are different balances to be maintained. Of course, we are very much interested in the promotion of organic products, fruits and vegetables, sustainably produced products, but there are these, we have the broader framework of the current legal base, and we have also issues pertaining to cultural heritage, which are also very important. Now, on the farm to fork strategy, what the farm to fork strategy actually says, and let me read it out to you on the promotion policy, it says in relation to meat, and this is about the review of the promotion policy, 
that review should focus on how the EU can use its promotion program to support the most sustainable carbon efficient methods of livestock production. So it does not say literally in the farm to fork strategy that we should not support livestock production. It says we should see how we can do so most sustainably. So in that sense, there is no explicit contradiction. So thank you. Thank you. And I'd quite like to bring you in here, Tim, um, just for a, a last remark of the conference before I close it. But I thought perhaps you might like to respond to what Honoré just said there, seeing as you raised these criticisms in your opening remark. So what would you like to say to, to this, what we've just heard? Yeah, I, I, I welcome those responses. I think the, um, the, the explicit contradiction is really in, in with the, the targets and the climate reduction targets. And the net zero target in particular that that's contained within the EU Green New Deal um, and and whether that can be achieved without substantial reductions in in the consumption and production of animal products and I think there's there's fairly conclusive evidence that that, that can't be achieved so we, we have to find some way of doing that um, and whether that's in whether that's in the cap proposal or whether that lies um, elsewhere in terms of policy and in terms of social change um, I think is, is an open question um but yeah uh yeah i think it, it's been a, a, an interesting kind of discussion we've touched on lots of areas of uh of, of food policy haven't we um and I, I do think i hope that that we can have a more honest and open discussion in the future about about the role of about the role of animal products alongside the role of organic because i think um everything we've heard today is about is about a multi-dimensional change um, and, and kind of, yes, we need to move towards more agroecological um, systems. And I, you know, Luigi's comments, I think were, were, um, were important on, okay, well, is there a role on, on marginal land for, for grazing animals? Obviously as, as, as vegan, for vegan consumers and, and as the vegan society, that's not something that we would support as animals in the food system, but, um, but I think we at least need to be honest about the broad direction of travel being, a, a, of substantial reduction in, in, in animal products. Um, and we need the policy to follow that, that aim. Tim, an excellent wrap up there. Thank you for um, taking the words out of my mouth, <laughs> doing my job for me. Um, I will now close this event. I, we could carry on talking about this for a long time, I think. It's a very, very interesting discussion. Um, I'd like to thank all of the panellists here in this panel and the, the last panel, as well as all the other speakers for their um, really interesting contributions to the, today's event. Um, as I said, the recordings will be available afterwards. Um, but if you're thinking that you know this wasn't enough and that you want more, well, you are in luck because, as I said, this is a two-day conference we will be back tomorrow bringing you even more discussions on um, plant-based and organic agriculture and the sustainable transition so and um, there's still time to register for your place tomorrow and um, we'll hear from the farmers themselves and kind of the perspective from the field which I think will be a perfect complement um, for today's discussions so on that note I'd like to thank you all again thank all of you as well for watching at home um, I'm Natasha Foot. I hope you have a wonderful afternoon and I hope to see you all again tomorrow thank you goodbye thank you Charlie.